many people are joining. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. How do I unmute people? Hello, Stacy. How you doing? Okay. Do you need to unmute people? Just a moment. I invited some friends to come to that. So I few Wonderful. more people from our Fife and Drum Corps and reenactment. Fantastic. This is great. How are you holding up? Okay, I decided, I guess I, I would make a good hermit. I did just fine. <laughs> I'm glad. So, so Fife and Drum Corps has been doing great. We didn't miss a beat. We played throughout the whole pandemic over Zoom. That's wonderful. Yeah, I cut my own hair, which is why I have a cap on. <laughs> In a while, I took the cap off so you could actually see me a little bit. But as you can tell, not uh, I'm not at that three great days growth of beard at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> so are you uh, are you doing this from your home right now? Um, I am. Um, wow. I'm doing it from home, and uh, I'm actually the host at the moment, so I'm letting everybody in. All right. I will turn it over to uh, the Great Barrington Library shortly, who is also my wife and also at home. So <laughs> it ah. all yes. So it looks like a lot of people joined without video. That's okay. Uh, yeah. At some point, I will take on the uh, the screen and just show you a bunch of stuff, and you can listen. Right. To I have to ask you, Tim. Is that called a double a, a double zoom? A double. If you and your wife are on the same one, you know, it, it's a little tricky. Um, <laughs> Possibly, very possibly. If a bear um, peeks through the back window, we had one here um, an hour ago. Um, wow. Yeah, they, they like our neighbor's garbage. So, excellent. Well, I'm delighted people are taking time to join. We'll, we'll start just shortly after, after seven. It does say you're there, I tell you. Yeah. Were you just talking about a bear? Uh, I was. Um, we had, I would think, about a 250-pound sow out um, two houses down from us in our very residential rural community. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But since my, my full-time job is conservationist, I guess I'm responsible for it being around, though I'm not responsible for the garbage. Yeah, I get them every once in a while. <clears throat> I'll just have you come over with me. Well, that's exciting seeing lots of people getting on here. That's great. It's an interesting topic and it's an interesting time. So yes. I'm going to mute myself while you get your wonderful everybody going. So I'll speak to you later. Thank you. Let's see if you're now a co host, my dear.
can you now see the participants? And can you let people in when um, they want to join? I don't know. Okay. That's fine. I should say that um, before we start, we are using my employer's Zoom for this um, as a as a gift to Great Barrington Library, which does not have it. So um, I have the awkward situation of being both the speaker and possibly the host. Though I'm going to try to offload a little of the host job as we go. Tim, I'm not sure whether you're aware of this or not, but are you aware you can get a Zoom account yourself free? Um, I am aware of that, um, and it's good for, I believe, 40 minutes. Um, uh, well, you, you can get, um, for like about 12 bucks a year, mm -hmm. you can get up to like 100 plus people for, you know, an hour and a half or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty a pretty reasonable deal. I would agree. Um, I, I was the one who signed my organization up, so my organization's account is mine. Uh, <laughs> but that's but that's good to know, and it's a lot cheaper than what we were finding. Okay, another person to join. Excellent. Well, this is great. When I've uh, talked at the library, sometimes we don't have this many people, so hooray for that. Okay, so I guess, can everyone hear me? Yeah. I'm seeing heads nodding. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Um, so we're going to get started. And if people join, they'll just sort of join after the introduction. Um, my name is Carly Leazar. I'm the Assistant Director for Programming at the Great Barrington Libraries. I'm also Tim Abbott's wife. Um, Tim is the Regional Land Conservation Director with the Housatonic Valley Association, and he lives in Canaan, Connecticut. He's an avid student of local history in 18th century America. He's president of Colonel Ogden's 1st New Jersey Res Regiment and involved with organizing and participating in public history events at numerous his historic sites and venues. His paper, Documentary Evidence for the Route of the Convention Army Through Connecticut in November 1778, was selected for inclusion in the holdings of the David Library of the American Revolution. He presented on the final fight of Shays' Rebellion in January 2020 in the annual Shays Symposium at the Springfield Armory. And the talk he's going to give us tonight is an extension of that presentation. And with that, over to Tim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it, is, it is conceivable that there might be some people joining us as I'm starting. Uh, so before I, I kick into the very exciting um, PowerPoint part of this, um, I will, I will do both duties of adding people to the meeting and setting the stage. Um, Shays' Rebellion is, is, I think, a, a hot topic right now, uh, as well it, it should be, but maybe not for the reasons that everyone supposes. Um, unless this is something you spend a lot of time thinking about, most of us encountered it as sort of an afterthought after Yorktown when we were making our way through elementary school or, or high school years ago. And um, the short version, unless you really live near where it happened, and friends here from uh, Central and Western Mass have a different take on it, um, but the short version tends to be um, folks got uh, 
upset after the war and um, tried to use the same tactics that they had used prior to the war and were ruthlessly crushed. Or, alternatively, um, folks stood up to the man and good for them. And both of those ideas uh, still sort of suffuse the event in um, our memories uh, going forward. And there's a lot actually of significance for this agrarian revolt that was something a little larger than that and actually bloodier than some people may recall um, in, in how uh, some of the conversations in the Constitutional Convention went, um, in how we started thinking about um, what it might mean to have uh, numerous states uh, working uh, cooperatively and uh, and little things like interstate commerce and um, law enforcement and uh, whose voices matter and is dissent disloyal all that stuff um, lies in this story so uh, a little a little background on why the Berkshires uh, most of the uh, scholarship on Shays Rebellion focuses uh, in Central Mass, uh, focuses on where Daniel Shays was from, focuses on um, a particular uh, unfortunate uh, repulse, uh, if you're a Shaysite, um, at the Springfield Armory, uh, where they were met with cannon fire, and, and doesn't focus on the last couple of months of this winter conflict. And that's what was going on in Western Massachusetts, and in fact, spilling over into neighboring states. And it has, it's messier. It, it, it has elements of it that, that uh, again, to refer to modern events, there are people who were uh, exercising their rights for peaceful assembly to protest, and there were looters. <laughs> and you get both of those things in this story. Um, you also get how it is remembered through generations. This, this was an embarrassing episode in Massachusetts uh, in the early federal period. And, and we'll discuss why people felt that way and, and whether, um, whether they're thinking about it has changed going forward. So uh, I'm going to share my screen and I will, um, I will spare you having to read some of the extensive primary source documentation because I will dramatically read it for you. Um, I'm a nut for that stuff, and uh, it's, it's instructive to hear how folk were communicating about these events uh, in their own language, and then uh, as the decades progress, um, how they kept retelling those stories. So we will start uh, with an effort here at sharing my screen. And from the beginning. All right, here I am actually um, several years ago standing at the, um, at that time leaning off its base, Shays Monument in Sheffield, Massachusetts, where the final fight of this um, uh, multiple month uh, uprising took place. And if you're looking at the map on the left, um, that part there that says skirmish, February 27th, that's an 1829 map that actually identified the, pretty accurately where it took place. Just below that map is Connecticut. Just to the um, left of that map is New York. So here's a farmer and uh, with, with the tools of his trade, uh, he's got one of those wonderful rakes that I want myself. He's got a plow. He has maybe a bottle that is a very small shovel otherwise. And this is from a cartoon that actually um, was published in 1788 in Connecticut. It's a detail from it. And he is saying, takes all to pay taxes. And indeed, that was at the heart of this issue um, in uh, 1786, very early independent Massachusetts. And here's part of the problem. Massive amount of debt, an unfeeling administration in Governor Bowdoin in uh, Boston, who insisted that debts must be paid for in specie, which nobody here had, um, huge state obligations from the war. And, and if you remember how Hamilton put um, the, the federal bank together, it was in part having the federal government assume some of these state debts, and he did it on the backs of 
soldiers, promissory, bounty lands, and other things. Um, if you look at, at um, the numbers there, they're staggering. Um, the, the amount of, of uh, um, gross domestic product in Massachusetts was, was well below the amount owed. Um, in, in addition, there was a major legal problem. Uh, courts had not functioned for much of the revolution. They were shut down just before it and for um, very close to seven years, no court activity at all. So that meant no um, legal transactions regarding property, uh, no settling of estates, no settling of debt, and of course with no national bank, everybody is indebted to everybody else. And this meant that it wasn't just the poor, um, the um, the soldiers who didn't get what they were expecting who were affected. It was uh, people with property who were suddenly facing major, major monetary distress. And a lot of them ended up in debtor's prison. This is the uh, a very interesting article from Massachusetts First uh, 1780 um, Constitution. And it's, it's, it's worth looking at. The people have a right in an orderly and peaceable manner to assemble to consult upon the common good give instructions to the representatives, and to request of the legislative body by the way of addresses, petitions, or remonstrances, redress of the wrongs done them and of the grievances they suffer. So there's a right to petition, and you think of our Constitution's um, First Amendment, that fourth section of it is drawing on this tradition, and many other states had similar rights. However, um, there is not a right to insurrection. Um, in, as I alluded to before, in 1774, a huge number of people assembled in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and shut down the courts. They actually dragged one magistrate who refused to renounce uh, holding the courts all the way down here to where I'm talking to you in Canaan, Connecticut, dragged him to the local liberty pole that had just gone up and threatened him until he renounced uh, what he had been doing 12 miles up the road in another state. So that was okay. That was an act of popular resistance in 1774. But in uh, 1786, um, this was insurrection, and, and the government of Massachusetts responded very, very forcefully, calling out um, between three and 4,000 militia uh, to keep the peace. Before I get into Oliver Partridge's letter here, we should talk about what that meant. That meant that, um, large numbers of troops from the central and eastern part of the state, uh, friends of government, were coming out for militia service while others of their neighbors and ones in the western part of the state were in arms protesting. Um, it, it was, in fact, uh, interesting to question whether they thought that protesting with arms would mean that it would actually come to bloodshed or whether that was not too far removed from the tradition of agrarian revolt where you um, break a few heads and, and, and yell at the, the folks in town and are eventually driven off. The, the people who were in arms were the young men of the uh, farmers who were in jail, young sons of the farmers who were in prison. Uh, most of them were quite young and we'll get into um, their demographics and the Berkshires um, shortly, but um, th they were not, let us say, um, people of my age or, or people of, of, of property. The people of property were, were being deprived of their property and their kids were out in the streets. Um, if that reminds you of today, uh, it reminds me of today. Um, there was, it's a winter conflict also. There's snow on the ground. People are marching through the, the hills of the Berkshires uh, to support the Shazites, as I think we'll call them for now for expediency's sake, um, in Central Mass. There, there is uh, that confrontation that happens with Daniel Shays and others um, at the Springfield Armory, repulsed with artillery and driven off, um, which as far as the uh, folks in the eastern part of the state meant that the, the uh, insurrection was largely put down. Uh, but out in the Berkshires, it still had another life. There were actually several incursions, and this letter is referring to one of them, uh, across from New York State, uh, into West Stockbridge and the Stockbridge area and Egremont, Massachusetts, prior to the final fight at Sheffield. Um, and, and they could have gotten much worse 
uh, than, than they actually turned out to be. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you a little bit of this letter from um, a doctor, Oliver Partridge, to Ezra Stiles, who's down at Yale, who's, who's um, in charge of that. You'll see other letters to him too. Uh, written at the end of January, 1787, when the sort of the seat of this conflict has shifted to snowy Western Massachusetts. And it's just interesting to hear how he describes this. I presume it may be entertaining for you to have some particulars of the transactions respecting the Massachusetts insurrections, which has of late taken place in Berkshire. It is supposed that two weeks past, more than two thirds of the inhabitants of this country were in favor of the insurrection. January 18th, Thursday letters arrived from Mr. Shays, leader of the insurgents, requesting that people turn out uh, to turn out and join him in Hampshire County to support their liberties and prevent oppression. 19th, I saw some of them on their way, others preparing from the 17th to the 31st instant. I have on occasion uh, in the way of my business to be in six towns, so there I observed. They continued to march without opposition until the 27th instant, um, even in small parties with provisions. Last week, friends to government began to take arms, though not without opposition in each town. 26th and 27th, Sheffield, Great Barrington, and Stockbridge companies made a junction at Stockbridge, perhaps 140 armed men. 28th and 29th, all that were expected joined in the morning, perhaps in the whole nearly 500 with one field piece. The 27th, 28th, 29th insurgents collected at West Stockbridge, about five miles distant. 27th in the evening, Saturday, more than 100 of the insurgents came into Stockbridge without arms, insulting language passed, not unexpected. 28th Sabbath, I saw the insurgents paraded, having a patient within 40 rods of their headquarters. Sabbath night, numbers joined them, and Mr. John Hubbard of Sheffield took the command. Same night, a patrol was taken by their guard, sent out from Stockbridge, where General Patterson commanded. Monday, the 29th a.m., by express, news arrived that General Patterson's men were not wanted in Hampshire, and expedition was planned and executed before 5 of the clock p.m., same day, which totally routed the insurgents at West Stockbridge. Four were wounded, but one of them badly. 84 taken prisoners, besides sleighs, horses, arms, and personal uh, matter of provisions was in their slaves. There's more along these lines, but what's interesting is that people panicked. They didn't fire the cannon on them. They, they did a little shooting. Uh, that, that following paragraph, which I won't uh, continue to read for you, talks about how some of the Shazites, some of the so-called insurgents, were actually expecting to be put to death and so fled when um, what might have been a, a feu de joie, uh, a celebratory firing by the friends of government happened uh, when they had initially laid down their arms. So it was really touch and go. And the question was, you know, were you really willing to kill your neighbors? Because some of these folks were definitely their neighbors. And um, one of the, the leaders uh, of the friends of government from Stockbridge, whose name will pop up later, was a man named Theodore Sedgwick, um, who implored um, some, of, some of the, uh, the men in arms uh, opposing them uh, to uh, disperse and, and and not uh, engage in, in bloodshed. And they largely avoided it. There were some injuries, but this was, this was a thing that could have gotten much, much worse um, and eventually did. So we don't have Daniel Shays out here in the Berkshires. Uh, we have Perez Hamlin. So you should learn a little about him. Uh, he, he was born in Sharon, Connecticut, which is just down the road from where I'm speaking to you. And his family moved here from Wareham, Massachusetts uh, uh, in 1742. His father was involved in the early iron works in Sharon. Um, he, by 1769, had moved over the border into what's now Columbia County, New York, um, and was involved in blacksmithing there, but he came back to Sharon to marry a woman named Rhoda Hunt. And, and when I looked at their marriage certificate, it said already he was from um, outside the community. He also part owned a mill in Lenox that he bought from his father um, in 1780. Uh, six, right before this happened. He um, had very little Revolutionary War experience that anyone can discover. Might have been a private in um, the 7th Albany County Militia during the Revolution, but unlike Daniel Shays, who was a Continental officer, Perez Hamlin simply um, was the person who pulled folk together for one more big incursion over the line um, after the fight that I had previously described. How many of the, the men with him were Revolutionary War veterans? Well, here's uh, a discharge given by uh, Henry Knox to one of them. Um, and there are some others, but um, we're very fortunate to know the names of quite a lot of them because a list of prisoners was taken. 
and having gone through that and then cross-referenced that with all the records that exist for who was in service, um, I found that perhaps three quarters or more of the people who were in arms at this time had no Revolutionary War service at all. And many of those who had had been involved in the war for um, uh, short periods of time, with some exceptions. What does that mean? Well, that means that the myth that this was all disgruntled former soldiers is, um, uh, doesn't hold up. And it is, in fact, young men without a lot of prospects. And that is um, an important part of the story. And here are the exceptions to the rule. Here are some local names uh, from uh, the Berkshires uh, of, of men who had been uh, Revolutionary War uh, veterans and who were with um, Hamlin, including Hamlin, um, at that time. And here's a list of where many of them were from. And again, because we have a list of prisoners, um, we also have um, an idea of what their occupations were. Almost all of them are laborer, so bottom of the pool. Um, husbandman means might have some property. Uh, there's only one uh, gentleman in this whole list. Um, everybody else, uh, and that's Reuben Freeman from Egremont, every, everybody else is, is, is low on the economic totem pole. And if you look here, and if you know the Berkshires at all, um, there's a lot of folk from Lee, there's a few from Lennox, um, good number from Egremont and Sheffield, and it continues, um, quite a lot from West Stockbridge, right there on the line uh, with New York, um, and a few New Yorkers. Um, there, there were more involved in the fight than this, but from the list of the prisoners, we have a pretty good sense um, of of who the, the, the Shazites uh, in the field were. So going back to our uh, 1829 map, uh, and to give you a sense of, of, of where we are, um, there's Great Barrington, uh, West Stockbridge up above, and, and let's, let's follow Hamlin into the, into the state toward this final, final fight in the end of February. And you gotta think, lots of snow on the ground. How are they getting around? So somewhere between 90 and 125 men cross in the night into West Stockbridge. They go to Stockbridge, loot the town, take a lot of prisoners, and march on to Great Barrington. Um, they targeted specifically people like Theodore Sedgwick's house, um, people who were seen as friends of government. But they were, they were looking for not just um, military equipment that they could use, um, they took horses, they took sleighs, they took private property. So some of this might be an effort to uh, continue their, their revolt, and some of this might be an opportunity to, to get, get some back. And there's both of those things going on. Proceeded down into Great Barrington, um, where they freed people from prison there, from debtor's prison, um, and then started to think about moving on down towards Sheffield. That's quite a distance. If you think about that, um, they've, those arrows are covering about 18 miles right now. Uh, a lot of their movement was done in sleighs. You, got, you kind of have to imagine, you know, Santa and his reindeer were how people were getting around, um, although there was some trudging along behind. We know about what they took in Stockbridge, because in the 1930s, when uh, in the midst of the Depression, it was felt that people like writers and historians needed jobs, the Works Public Administration sent a bunch of folk into old courthouses to copy down old records. And so we actually have records of what um, was taken from many of these houses. And here's some examples. And here's who was, here's who was taking them. Um, just, just for example here, a silver mounted sword valued at six pounds, one gun bayonet valued at one pound, 16 shillings, one powder horn and cartridge box valued at 12 shillings, fine. But then we're looking at shirts, we're looking at hats, um, people were stealing silverware. It was a mix of stuff. Um, this was important because at the end of the day when it was time for an accounting, the people who had been involved in taking property were more likely to be brought to trial and charged and maybe even charged with capital offenses than the people who simply took up arms. Figuring out what happened in Sheffield meant going to a lot of primary sources. And so um, here are a couple of them to look at. Here's a, here's a letter 
uh, to start with about what happened in Stockbridge uh, when the looting took place. And, it, and it's interesting reading. On, on Tuesday morning, the 27th Ultimo, about daybreak, I had my house surrounded by 12 armed men with a demand of entrance and surrender to Shays with the most horrid imprecations and diabolical visions that it is possible to possess the human appearance. Before we could have time to determine whether it would be best to grant them entrance, they drove their bayonets through the window of my lodging room and by repeated thrust broke the sash and six or eight lights of glass. In the room I, my wife and small children lodged, and then with the same degree of violence burst an outside door and an entry door which led into the same room. Pointed the bayonet to my wife's breast with a demand of arms and ammunition, at the same time, they had found entrance into almost every room of my house. After getting what arms and ammunition they could find and what plunder they pleased, which consisted of clothing, silver buckles, some cash hats, etc., etc., they ordered us to prepare to march immediately to headquarters, which was then at Mr. Bingham's, current Red Lion Inn at Beneath Stockton, where I found almost all my neighbors in the same unhappy situation. The commanding officer, Captain Hamlin, informed me that I must go with him and gave me permission to return home and take a horse or sleigh and what other comforts I pleased, which I considered as a very great indulgence. They plundered six horses and mounted them as vedettes and marched out of town, uh, sun almost two hours high in the morning with 32 prisoners. We went to Barrington where they were joined by a number more. Our friends at Barrington got information timely to make their escape to Sheffield. So this was not good in Stockbridge. That sort of insulting comments that happened with the previous incursion now became outright um, housebreaking and and taking a number of citizens captive. Here's an interesting mem uh, recollection later in life by a man who was just about three years old when this happened. And he said, my earliest recollection is a belligerent one. The first thing I remember is waking in the night and seeing a number of brutal soldiers with their green boughs, the insignia of rebellion, waving over the bed where my father and I lay. The dreadful gleam of their arms was reflected by the burning lights in the room. They demanded the surrender of my father, and I shrieked in an agony of terror as my father passed me between the guns to the arms of my sister. They plundered the house most unsparingly and continued these deprecations for some time, going from house to house, frightening the inmates unmercifully. This is the way Shays' Rebellion is remembered in Stockbridge. So who's opposing um, Hamlin and his supporters? There are some loyal forces of government, but most of the others are up in Pittsfield or have been coming back from Hampshire. So the folks that are left are gathering in Sheffield. Colonel John Ashley Jr., who was Colonel of the Southern Berkshire Militia Regiment during the war and continued in that uh, position afterwards, um, was the senior officer, aided by about 40 loyal Sheffield militia under Lieutenant Joseph Goodrich, and joined by another 40 Great Barrington Militia under Lieutenant Thomas Ingersoll. And then following along behind from the North was Captain William Walker of Lennox with Lennox and Stockbridge Militia trailing the insurgents. And those folks were in sleighs. And we actually have a receipt uh, that they build for the use of horses and sleighs. Um, Walker actually um, build for two sleighs. Um, that still survives in the Lennox Town Hall. So it's about 120 on a side, uh, but in two different groups. So Ashley and his militia and Goodrich and, ha and uh, Ingersoll are maneuvering ahead of them down into Sheffield and then they start moving up toward Egremont and then they hear that they're being pursued on a different road and they turn back to face them. While Walker is coming down from Stockbridge uh, with his sleighs. And there's the fight, that's where it's gonna be. So Colonel Ashley wrote to Major General Lincoln, who's in charge uh, of the Massachusetts militia at the end of that fight, which took place in the afternoon, and this is what he wrote. The rebels began the attack by a scattering fire from a considerable distance. The troops under my command advanced rapidly towards them and a warm fire commenced, which continued about six minutes when the rebels fled in a very great disorder in different directions. The woods and morasses, whoops, I'm gonna go back to that for a moment. The woods and morasses bordering on the field of action rendered our pursuing them with success impracticable. Captain Hamlin, who commanded the rebels, is dangerously, if not mortally wounded. Two of the enemy were killed, whom we have found. 
probably more in the woods whom we have not discovered. 25 of them we have taken prisoners and three wounded. The loss on our side was two killed and one of them a prisoner with the rebels and probably killed by our fire, and one wounded, a worthy young gentleman, a son of Mr. Burghardt of Great Barrington. The spirit and firmness of the troops, many of whom discharged six rounds during the action, deserve commendation. The Northern militia arrived soon after the action and facilitated the capture of the prisoners. So in trying to figure out how this played out, I start with Ashley and I start with his after action, action report. And, and it holds up. Most of what he describes here is borne out um, by other uh, contemporary accounts. And then it gets a little bit overblown. Here's what Benjamin Lincoln wrote to George Washington about it a week later. The parties I mentioned to your excellency, which were lurking on the borders of the state, remained inactive for some time, with the hope and expectation, as their leaders taught them to believe, that they should be reinforced from different quarters. And they were credulous enough to expect aid from Canada. Thus matters remained until the morning of the 27th Ultimo, when there appeared about 120 of them in Stockbridge, who were in a very defenseless state. Besides, they were completely surprised. The insurgents took a number of the leading characters in that town, plundered many of the inhabitants, and stole a number of horses. They then, flushed with success, proceeded on to Barrington. On the approach, the well-affected militia retired before them towards Sheffield, were met by the militia of that town, commanded by Colonel Ashley. The halt of the, insurg the insurgents made in Barrington gave time for the Lennox and Stockbridge militia to collect and follow them. Colonel Ashley, having collected about 80 men, came to a resolution to march in pursuit of the rebels and to attack them where he should find them. He very soon fell in with them. They were marching in files, had their prisoners in the center. Their front division formed a line on one side of the road. That left our prisoners in the front of the rear. It is said the rear did not form, that the whole were routed before they had time to do it. Two or three men on each side were killed and a number wounded, among them one Hamlin, commander of the uh, of the party. His wounds are dangerous. As they retreated, they fell into the hands of the militia from Stockbridge. Okay, so those of you who are Revolutionary War reenactors, you can kind of picture this. You got two divisions, they're marching in file, and in between them are the prisoners. The first uncovers, probably to the left, based on who, who eventually got killed on the government side, so displayed to the left. The right did not display, the prisoners are caught in friendly fire. But it's getting a little bit overblown now because all the other papers pick it up. Um, by the time the Pennsylvania Packet and General Advertiser decides to uh, reprint what was printed in Hartford about it, um, the, the number of um, insurgents is up to 125. Uh, the number of uh, wounded is up to something really high, about 35. Um, but there is a description of Hamlin's injuries here uh, that he was wounded in the breast and foot. Um, otherwise, it's a little overblown. By 1829, the local histories are writing about it in very local ways. And it's this account in the history of Berkshire County that helped really understand what the terrain was like at that time. Captain Goodrich's company went through a lot of girdled trees on the west side of the road and the Great Barrington Company under Ingersoll, both of whom are actually lieutenants, advanced through a copse of timber on the east. So they're displaying on either side of the road in two different kinds of timber, and they've got some people advanced a little bit. Um, and, and because they were being met by, uh, because they, they met the insurgents marching in column, they were able to, to direct quite a fire on them uh, and, and that they were not able to return particularly effectively. And that's interesting. And, and, and so you can figure out from the terrain pretty much exactly where that took place if you're on that site today. And even in 1854, in another Stockbridge history, they acknowledge that although it sounds like the prisoners might have been put in front, you know, as human shields, that in fact that didn't happen. There could have been little or no opportunity to form in the place uh, of the prisoners between the two armies, uh, and place the prisoners between the two armies as has generally been represented. They even then remembered that. This is what happened to one of the Stockbridge um, friends of government who was a prisoner who actually was killed by friendly fire, and his name was Solomon Gleason. Seeing their position, Mr. Gleason said to Mr. Jones, who's a fellow prisoner, let's run. They instantly started, but as they leapt the fence, Mr. Gleason received a ball in his chin, which passing into the throat produced a death wound. He fell into the brush, and Mr. Jones, dropping beside him, took his head upon his knee and supported it till life was extinct. So this is a map I made to give a sense of how this played out. 
Hamlin and his men in green, because they've got green boughs in their head, with the prisoners in blue in the middle are marching in two divisions from Great Barrington on the West Road toward the road that goes from um, uh, Sheffield to um, Egermont. And so Colonel Ashley, with his two companies, has them display on either side of the road. You can see the girdled trees on the west with Goodrich's, and you can see the little forest on the right with Ingersoll. And then as they close in and start firing, only the first division has displayed. The prisoners are exposed. The X you see off to one side is my assumption as to where Gleason probably fell, though he could have jumped on the other side of the road. There's also an X down with Ingersoll because the one person on the uh, loyal to government side who was killed was from the Great Barrington Company, so I assume on that side, which is why I have the um, Chazites displaying on the same side as the Great Barrington people. It makes sense for that injury to happen there, but it could conceivably have been on either side. So who do we know was killed? Um, on the side of the Shazites, um, Oziel Wilcox of Lee, who had a brother coming down with the loyal troops and had another brother who was captured. So that family was split. Maybe there's another, but no one has been able to, disturb, to discover who that person's name was. And maybe they assumed it was Hamlin who was dead, but Hamlin didn't die. So we know of one killed for sure. Mortally wounded a man named Joshua Rathburn or Rathburn from Tearingham. Wounded for sure, Captain Hamlin and three to five others. That seems to be it. So firing six balls, fighting for about six minutes, and then a lot of people fleeing and then being swept up by, by being surrounded from, from the other side. You can find the graves of the two uh, friends of government if you hunt around. Um, Solomon Gleason's there on the left, and his stone actually talks about being killed at the uh, fight in Sheffield, and that's in Stockbridge. And this is a number of years ago. Those who know my six foot son can see him when he was not even five feet there. Um, that's Elias uh, and Emily down below, um, his older sister. And that was us decorating um, Ephraim Porter's stone in the Mahawi Cemetery in Great Barrington, which never had a flag and we felt it needed one. And then there was a really awful wound on the side of the Friends of Government. And this, this amuses me because this is the kind of letter that was sent excusing a Yale student's absence uh, from college. Um, and it was written on his behalf, again, to Reverend uh, Stiles. Um, and, and, and I'm just gonna read it in total because it's, it's both amusing and horrifying in the same degree. Imagine this as, I'm sorry I'm not back in college, but I was shot with buck and ball kind of letter. I write you at the request of Mr. Burghardt and his son, your pupil, though he needs no apology for not having sooner returned to his studies, yet he wishes me to acquaint you with the reasons of his long delay. He was near four weeks indefatigably employed in endeavorings to subdue the rebels in this country. He discharged his duty with honor and obtained a dismission. A few days before the troop of horse in which he served was discharged with a view immediately uh, to repair to New Haven, he made the necessary preparations and began his journey on Tuesday last. He had not gotten out of town before an express arrived with intelligence that a large body of rebels were on their march from Stockbridge to this town. Anxious to defend his country from the brutal savages of a lawless banditti, he again had recourse to arms and determined to wait the event. A battle ensued. After the rebels were put to flight, Burghardt was shot from his horse by one of the fugitives. He was at first supposed to be mortally wounded, but is at present, blessed be God, in a fair way to recover. He was about 20 feet distant from the man who shot him. He received a musket ball in his right arm, which came out behind his shoulder. A swan shot entered the upper part of his right breast and is supposed to be lodged under his shoulder. Another entered his arm about an inch from the orifice made by the entry of the ball, which is lodged in the flesh. A third entered his side by the ribs and was cut out by the surgeon about five inches back of the place where it entered. His present circumstances being such, you will not expect him for a considerable time. So those of you who are wondering about the lethality of um, buck and ball, swan shot's not small. We're, this guy is massively lucky um, that um, these are the, this is the extent of the injuries he took at 20 foot distance. Um, he's with the pursuing men from, from uh, uh, Lennox and he's uh, sweeping up prisoners when he gets shot by one. 
And then there were the court cases. And this is where they had to really figure out what are we gonna do with our fellow citizens? Are we going to hang our neighbor's sons? And here is a letter from Increase Sumner who sat in one of the tribunals uh, to his wife after um, condemning six men to death in uh, Great Barrington. We tried seven persons on different indictments for high treason, one of whom only was acquitted. The name of the six who were convicted are as follows. Samuel Rust of Pittsfield, Aaron Knapp, Nathaniel Austin, Enoch Tyler of Sheffield, Peter Wilcox Jr., that's Ozio Wilcox's brother, by the way, and Joseph Williams of Egremont, all of whom, except Rust, were taken in the Sheffield action by Colonel Ashley. And on Thursday last, had a most solemn and affecting sentence of death pronounced against them by the Chief Justice. Dr. Whiting, First Justice of their Court of Common Pleas, was indicted and tried for exciting sedition and insurrection and was, after a long trial, found guilty and a sentence of seven months imprisonment, a hundred pounds fine, and bound over for his good behavior for five years, in which he was greatly overcome and is now confined to his bed with sickness. Great numbers of others were indicted for crimes below treason, most of whom submitted by pleading guilty and received their respective punishments. The commissioners pardoned on condition of their exertions to promote order and good government upwards of 100. Great numbers were bound over for trial next term and 14 lads were identified on condition of their enlisting into the federal army, which they did. And I hope we'll fight better than those if they should be called to it than they did in the Sheffield action. Now, those death sentences actually were never carried out. A couple of those folks escaped and others were eventually pardoned because there was a change of government. And um, John Hancock went back to become governor of Massachusetts, replacing the odious Governor Bowdoin, um, and he was of a more conciliatory mind. And so there were a series of opportunities for pardons for all but the most notorious uh, of the insurrectionists um, all the way into June of 1787. And Theodore Sedgwick, the man from Stockbridge who had implored an earlier incursion to disperse and who had his house looted, ended up being one of the attorneys defending the men who were condemned. And he actually petitioned for mercy for several of them. And here are some examples. The father of Nathaniel Austin is of a respectable descent. I've known him long and at all times favorable to government. In addition to which, Mr. Austin is an infirm man and so afflicted with the situation of his son that it is not unlikely his execution may prove fatal to him. The young man has a decent wife and three small children, and I am induced to believe that it was more owing to the arts and seduction of others than to his own depraved disposition that he has taken the part he has in the rebellion, and so on. So that's interesting. And, and Sedgwick didn't stop there. He argued for some, several other people as well. Um, he tried to actually make a case for Peter Wilcox, saying, um, there is among the convicts one Peter Wilcox Jr. of whom I know little. He had, however, a brother slain in the action at Sheffield. He is a young man and appears little acquainted with any subject. The friends of Wilcox, the convict, have informed me that further application will be made for his pardon. They have been so extremely importunate with me to make one of the number who have made another address for mercy to be extended to him. From an unfortunate combination of circumstances, it has so happened that those who are the most proper objects of capital punishment are now beyond the reach of justice. Why? Because they went to Vermont. Or they went over the border to New York, and Massachusetts law was not in effect there. At the end of the day, there were only two people hanged in Berkshire County as a result of the violence that happened in the Berkshires as part of Shays' Rebellion, and both of them uh, burned barns and broke into houses in broad daylight on their own, not part of this. That was it. Some people spent some time in jail, um, but by and large, um, they showed mercy and lenience. Wonder why that was besides the fact that it's hard to hang your neighbor's kids. Probably not because of letters like this. Um, this is very Robin Hood-esque, and it was reprinted uh, in uh, a local paper. To Colonel Hyde, High Sheriff of the County of Berkshire, etc., with care. New Lebanon, April 15th, 1787. Sir, please to take this for a compliment. I understand that there is a number of my countrymen condemned to die because they fought for justice. I pray, have a care that you assist not at the execution of so horrid a crime, for by all that is above, he that condemns and he that executes shall share alike. So, no more at present, but prepare for death with speed. 
for your life or mine is short when the woods are well covered with leaves. I shall return and pay you a short visit. So no more at present, but I remain your most inveterate enemy. Love that. Love it. I'm not sure the sheriff cared, but at this point, things had wound down considerably. But there were still major questions about how come we can't deal with border ruffians? So letters went back and forth across the new state boundaries to folks in New York from folks in Massachusetts saying, um, what's up? Why aren't you suppressing this rebellion? And at the bottom here, I think it's rather important. To return to Hamlin's expedition, it is, I believe, an undoubted fact that if he had retired with his prisoners taken at Stockbridge back into your state, that a number of our people, stimulated with revenge, would, to regain their property, have gone over the jurisdiction line of the two states. Reflect a little, sir, what may be the probable issue if we go armed among you. What is done from your state by Hamlin and others is almost tantamount to it in the opinion of a great number of our people. So, what else is going on in 1787? Very soon after this, the Constitutional Convention. And it's absolutely on the minds of a number of delegates. It's also on the minds of people in neighboring states up here to Massachusetts. When it came time to ratify the Constitution, it was done by delegates from each town in Massachusetts. The town elected the person who would go and cast the vote. In Great Barrington, a Shazites, a Shays supporter, was elected and went and voted against it. In Sheffield, where this fight happened, they voted at the most narrow margins to support ratifying the new constitution. It was almost evenly divided among whom to send. On the first ballot, Colonel Ashley had one more vote than John Hubbard, who was the lieutenant who led the incursion previously into West Stockbridge. On the second ballot, Ashley won by 133 to 129. This is the site of the, um, the fight at Sheffield today. Um, the, the stone has had great attention paid to it. It's now upright. There's a kiosk and um, the top half of it includes some words that I wrote. Um, there's a nice cultivar of an American elm. Um, and you can, if you go there, get a sense of the terrain. What is interesting is that that monument was erected in the early 20th century. And it's not to the Shazites, right? It's to the friends of government. This was, in most of the histories of this area, uh, a blight on our new democracy. That's how they chose to remember it. But they also chose to sort of shove it aside and forget about parts of it because it was deeply divisive and it involved um, neighbors and it involved um, questions of um, how do you justly exercise your rights to uh, redress of grievances and it involved age-old resentments of the power of elites in eastern Massachusetts which exist to this day in our area and so it is it, to sort of wrap this up with today's part of the story um, it's worth thinking back at the very beginning of our federal experiment on how we dealt with those questions, those First Amendment questions, those use of force questions. How do you deal with, um, with violence in the face of injustice or perceived injustice? What's the right role of the state? How should mercy be shown? Those, those questions, um, I think, are um, as relevant today. Um, as they were back when we were just figuring out how to make all this work. Um, so I will stop uh, sharing my screen at this point. Thank you for listening. Um, I guess there's a couple ways we can handle questions at this point. Uh, we can do them by um, submitting them in chat, or you can raise your hand and unmute yourself. I'm, I'm happy actually with that if anyone has a question and would like to, um, and I'll, I'll respond to them as they come. Thank you. Dennis? Uh, yes, uh, Tim, I, I was just kind of curious on how much you have dug into, uh, you know, some of the history of some of the other individuals like Sedgwick, who mm. 
uh, being being a Sheffield person, yep. you know, he, he uh, this is really where he started out. Down That's here. right. In fact, right, right, right across from, you know, the center of Sheffield is the Cedric House you know, and so forth. <laughs> Indeed it and, is. And of course, is very famous in the tales of uh, Mumbet and so on. You know. Which took place during that raid. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So, so, so those of you who may not know the Mumbet story, Elizabeth Freeman um, was uh, one of two uh, people of color who successfully um, sued the state of Massachusetts under its 1780 Constitution for their freedom, uh, and were the first so liberated. Um, but she also, uh, and she had been an Ashley um, slave before then, Colonel Ashley's slave, um, and and the attorney. Who supported her in that uh, was the same Theodore Cedric, fascinating guy. She ended up in his household in Stockbridge and was there um, defending the family silver, uh, as the story goes, um, six years later uh, when when Perez Hamlin and, and company came to town. Yeah, he's he's fascinating. And of course, um, one of his later uh, relatives, Catherine Cedric, during the Civil War was an ardent abolitionist writer as well. And related to the Sedgwick, John Sedgwick, uh, commander of the Sixth Corps, who was uh, shot and killed in Spotsylvania. Thomas. And, yes. uh, first of all, Tim, that was really excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. So um, Theodore Sedgwick also was the first congressman from Western Massachusetts after the ratification. Mm. 87. And that sort of leads me to, I guess, a comment and maybe a question. So um, back in the 1980s, I worked for Silvio Conti, who yes. obviously successor of Theodore Sedgwick, 200 years later. Yep. Um, and during the time that I worked for Congressman Conti, he introduced a resolution that commemorated the bicentennial of Shays Rebellion. And when I saw that you were giving this lecture, it brought back these great memories of helping Congressman Conti get co-sponsors on this resolution, mm. which ended up getting signed into law by President Reagan yes. in 1987. And it really, your comments really bring back a lot of fond memories for me because mm. it made me think about the importance of Shays' Rebellion to the founding of the country and, to, and in some degree, to the need for the Constitution, to the need for some form of of federalist government, of, of to the need for some form of a strong national government. Yes. But with respect for the rights of those who were not the elite, and it, they're, they're, and I think that really, yeah. and I worked with Congressman Conti for ten years, and I, so I got to know him pretty well, and I think that's really where he came at this from. Mm -hmm. It was the Elites versus the um, the people who didn't have power. Right. And I think you really brought that out really well, and so I, I I guess that's really my comment. I just want to thank you for for that. Oh well, I'm really touched, and I'm I'm also delighted to hear of your association with that. Um, that declaration um, is why the Springfield Armory has its Shays Symposium um, every year uh, on the anniversary of that date. Um, that's wonderful. Jennifer, you, you had a question. Um, Came in a half hour late. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, great. Um, so I'm so sorry. I, I'm just, I'm reading up now uh, in Wikipedia and, and apparently this all took place in Springfield. So I'm a little confused. Did you so, explain that earlier on? Yeah, be, yeah I did, but I'd be happy to. Uh, Shay's Rebellion affected two thirds of the state in different ways. Um, Daniel Shays uh, was from Central Mass, and the, uh, the action at the Springfield Armory preceded the events in Berkshire County that I talked about um, in uh, the last half hour or so, um, and, and culminated in um, artillery fire, uh, killing and wounding several, uh, and dispersing um, the Shaysites uh, in early January there. And then everything that I was talking about was how the rest of that um, uh, insurrection resistance uh, played out in uh, Berkshire County, where it had this cross-border character, as well as sort of, um, as, as Thomas said, um, 
people without a voice um, standing up to power. Mm -hmm. And was there a declaration made in Springfield about the purpose of the rebellion? There were a number of letters written, and Shays gets his name attached to it because he was a prominent voice, although um, there, there were numerous people who in their communities were seen as uh, leaders of this popular uh, movement. Um, some of them ended up on the list of people who could not be um, uh, given amnesty uh, when it all was shut down. Some of them ran off to uh, Vermont and elsewhere. Most were eventually pardoned. Um, and again, the issues come down to uh, crippling debt, the inability to pay those debts with hard currency, an insensitive um, governor in Governor Bowden, um, the problems of um, young men with no property and no prospects, um, and real questions as to whether the tactics that were used in popular resistance that brought on the revolution were um, still appropriate. Um, after after the, the establishment of the country and the opinion of Massachusetts government was absolutely not. It's an insurrection. Uh, they are rebels. And, and I think there is still some question as to whether just because they were um, parading with arms, they fully intended um, to have a sharp uh, uh, engagement. Remember, this is winter. And, and, and they're moving around in deep snow and they're covering a lot of ground not the best time to go for an all-out campaign. But like perhaps protesters who shut down um, uh, state, state capitals uh, bearing arms uh, today, uh, there may have been quite a lot of that going on then too. And then there were some people who were out to loot. So it had all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Amanda. The crippling, the crippling debt was was forced upon these gentlemen farmers in rural areas through government uh, taxation or just their own? The, the biggest problem is you had, no, you had no, um, no national bank, no, no, no uh, really available currency, so everybody was indebted to everybody, all the way up to the top. The importers like, like, uh, like Hancock, who, who became very wealthy uh, moving goods, um, legally and otherwise uh, under British rule into Boston, um, we're also dealing with an embargo after that. Um, we were not given access to, to British ports after we got our independence for some considerable period of time. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, it was a major economic depression and no money to pay for it. And, oh. and government was not sympathetic to that. Thanks. Amanda, did you have a question? Please unmute yes. yourself. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, so uh, I remember reading a few years ago about a discovery of possibly a settlement in Vermont. Yes. Um, that Can you talk about that a little bit? I, I read the book, but mm -hmm. I haven't seen an update about it since like 2016, I think. I, I'm really happy you asked about that, and I'm even more happy that I presented at the most recent Shays Symposium where a fellow presenter did nothing but talk about that. So I can tell you what I was told. Um, up uh, near Dorset Mountain, um, and, and in fact, there's a name for a hill up there that I, is not on the top of my head, but that, that re refers to um, smallpox uh, or, or, or some kind of a plague. Um, there is, there is a, a confirmed settlement of refugee Shazites, um, and it's, it, it's up on a hillside, and they have done tremendous amounts of um, archaeological work to sort of determine the extent of it. Daniel Shays was there, um, and, and it was occupied until about 1815, uh, when a lot of people there um, got one of the plagues that was going around, and I can't remember if it was smallpox or something else, but um, those who were left were sort of removed and it was burned to the ground. Uh, but it, it has a defensible um, area with very high walls. It had a mill. Um, and it was in Vermont, which at that time um, had not uh, was was not one of one of the the thirteen states. Uh, was still an independent republic, and um, it it is fascinating. It's very near the New York border, uh, 
And indeed, there were efforts made from Massachusetts to pursue and bring back some of the um, uh, refugees who had fled there after the Springfield fight. So they, they were not um, simply being paranoid. Um, it's a fascinating, fascinating story. Um, and it had been rumor for many, many years, but, but recent um, archaeological work has, has, has borne out the settlement. Thanks. Bruce. I was surprised to learn a couple of weeks ago that when Jefferson wrote a little rebellion now and then is a good thing, he was referring to Shays. Any, ins any insight on that? I have always assumed he was referring to the French Revolution because that's when the quote comes. Um, but there were, there were different schools of thought in, um, at the Constitutional Convention, and Jefferson was not there for that, uh, but there were different schools of thought as to what this represented. Most of the delegates were appalled and frightened by it. Um, and those yeah. who were the, um, the contrary voices, the ones who often ended up as anti-federalists uh, a couple years later, uh, really were concerned about um, the overreach of a, a an unaccountable government, particularly one um, where you didn't have um, people near you representing you. And, and that was one of the things that made them quite nervous about, um, about have, giving Congress the kind of power it ultimately had in the Constitution, because that's a lot of trust to put in a representative who, who um, is, is representing people who you may not feel much in common with elsewhere in the state. So there was always that. But there was always a huge, what I guess we would call First Amendment question, uh, even before there was a First Amendment. All of those things that many of the state constitutions gave, the right to assemble, the right to petition for redress of grievances, um, all of those so-called bills of rights uh, were incorporated into many of the state constitutions prior to our own. And it's what caused great distress, and Jefferson also expressed this, when after three and a half or four months in Philadelphia, um, the Constitution emerges without a Bill of Rights. And it's why there was such insistence on one afterwards. People were accustomed to those. They felt like those rights were worth expressing. Um, and particularly the ones that had to do with um, you know, wh whether you will be marginalized or whether you, wh and, and how much you, you will, uh, your voice will matter. Those things, those things were all in play. I saw it in online a letter from Jefferson to Madison. Mm -hmm. That's he had the letter had both. You know, he talked about he, he, he expressed that quote, and then he had talked about Shay's rebellion in the same letter. So I assumed I, that was the genesis. My my guess is that he has both of those things in mind, and it's well worth looking. I I love looking at the the primary sources and then interpreting them. Um, you, you'll note that I made use of some secondary sources, mostly to help determine what the heck happened in Sheffield <laughs> and what happened to people there. But those first accounts, even if it's in the fog of, of, of war, um, are important to hear. And it's, it's why my presentation is so heavy on, on 18th century language. It's, it's, um, we'll spend a lot of time parsing it and thinking about it and, and, and using our own perspectives to, to assign meaning to it. But, it is also really important to see the full context in which those those excerpts and quotes happen. So I will I will actually go look for that letter and and, and read it after this. I'll be interested to see um, if if that connection is strong. Tim, I had uh, sent you a, a a little thing on chat. I don't know whether you've had a chance to see it or not. There, we're not using the hands up thing in here. So <laughs> let me quickly look there and see. Um, yeah, I can certainly try and handle another uh, Sedgwick question. Go, go for it. <laughs> uh, well, this one deals actually with, uh, are you, I, with your background, I have a feeling you're probably also familiar with something called the Sheffield Resolves. Uh, yes, I do remember the Sheffield Resolves. Okay. One of the things I've never, I've thought about, but I've never wanted to do, wanted to do the work to find out. Mm -hmm. 
and hoping that you could do that work for me by just telling me, mm. I've often wondered whether Sedgwick was involved in that at any point in time. I think he was, he was still in Sheffield during that time. I think he was. And what I can't remember and what I will have to now um, go down that rabbit hole for you, perhaps after. <laughs> um, well, this is how it works, right? Um, I, I, I can't remember, um, you know, how, how strongly he felt one way or the other there, but he was very much a presence um, and he would have had an opinion. Uh, I just can't at the moment remember. Yeah, I, I don't recall from having seen both the... Uh, a, a copy of the original as well as the copy that's uh, uh, down in Washington, D.C. of the resolves. I don't see his name on it anywhere. That's interesting. Um, that's very, very interesting. All it means is that I might not have read, you know, that era writing very well also. You know? <laughs> I, I, I'm fortunate to have stared at enough of it so that it, it, it's now more discernible than it might have otherwise. Um, we'll definitely follow up. I see in the chat that Bill also asked, is the Burgart person any relation to the B in W.E.B. Du Bois? I've had that same question um, because, because that is indeed the name and it is a Great Barrington uh, and, and uh, Stockbridge era name. Uh, so um, my guess is it probably is, but I don't know the answer. And so it would be interesting. And, and, and Du Bois actually did write out the genealogy of the Burgart family. So whether it is a name that is a blood relation or a name of people who took on that last name or a name of people who were enslaved by a Burgart, I don't know the answer to that, but I suspect. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a Burgart, Burghart house. Yep. It's almost right where uh, E.W. E. Du Bois was born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for the Pennsylvanians who are on this, uh, and thank you very much to my, my friends who did, did join this uh, from farther afield, of course, you have your Whiskey Rebellion. And uh, it's as steeped in um, mythology and imagination as, as Shays is for us, and, and worth um, doing some digging into, um, uh, because it's probably more than just, I don't feel like paying my taxes with corn liquor. It probably has a lot more to do with frontier values and representation values and 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 other issues of of who who gets to do what in in Penn's domain um, and those things happen throughout american history there there are um, resistance movements and separatist movements and i don't like external authority movements that happen um, from all political persuasions um, and we're continuing to test that stuff uh, in this very day, which is where I think the the non-local relevance of this topic lies. Once you get this thing completely solved, you might want to take a look at something that's a, a more current era, that basically the same types of things happened mm. in in uh, uh, the, 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 the Midwest, yes. especially in Nebraska and uh, Eastern Colorado, and parts of Kansas during the Dust Bowl slash Depression, where, yes. where, where basically groups would form because someone's farm was going to be taken for taxes. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, they never got to the extent of what this was like here. But, you know, that, that didn't go away, <laughs> that type um, of thinking. <laughs> it, it certainly didn't. And, and it's, it's a tension all the way along. And, of course, we're hearing... Largely, we're hearing the voices of um, the, the folks who um, were on the side of government here. It's harder to find, although there are a few there, um, first-person accounts by supporters of, of, of Shays, um, although there are a few, and there's that wonderful, if a little overblown, you're inveterate enemy threat from across the border. But there's, I mean, Whiting's an interesting character, too, because he was, he was one of the justices of the Court of Common Pleas here, who was very much in favor of um, the cause of Shays, and and he suffered for it. And and as you saw the the sentence he had, it um, um, it was pretty strong for for a person of, of position to be to be uh, uh, given that kind of a um, not quite death, but yes, you're gonna you're gonna lose your your um, honor and money and a few other things along the way. But uh, as is often the case, the, the folks in the field are the young. Well, I'd love to um, just 
extend my thanks to all of you for, for hanging in with me for a little over an hour and listening to archaic language and, and, and talking about uh, uh, old history with, I think, still contemporary uh, relevance. I, I'm deeply grateful, and I'm grateful to, uh, to Talia and the uh, Great Barrington Library for, for uh, hosting this event. Thank you. We have recorded this, and so we are going to actually have a recording of this program up on the library website. So if you came in late, or if you know somebody who wanted to be here but couldn't, uh, we will have that available so people will be able to catch up. And if people have burning questions, I'm sure we can find a way to get them to answer them for you. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you, friends. Thanks for your interest in, in um, this history and, uh, and for your time. Have a great evening.